Good morning and welcome to Worship with Cumber Methodist. It's great to share with you this morning, whether you are a regular with us when we were able to gather in the building in Bridge Street, or if you've been joining with us since we have been online, or perhaps you're even watching us for the very first time. And we also want to welcome those who are listening on our telephone line service. This is a way for those who don't have internet access to connect with us as we worship. So if you know someone who's missing gathering together for worship and doesn't have access to YouTube or Facebook, please feel free to share our telephone service line number with them. It's a local call number 028 9104 2345. As we meet together this morning, we listen to some words from Psalm 57. It says, My heart is confident in you, O God, my heart is confident. No wonder I can sing your praises. I will thank you, Lord, among all the people. I will sing your praises among the nations. For your unfailing love is as high as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the highest heavens. Your glory shine over all the earth. Pat Marsh in her book Dwelling in the Psalm says, This psalm is a testament to the power of belief in God and to how worship can draw us closer to his heart. As we speak out our faith in God, that faith grows stronger. As we sing it out, our spirit is lifted into a deep communion with him and that the joy that awakens in us calms all our fear. Our song becomes our prayer and the prayer results in a deep inner knowing that all will be well. As we come into God's presence to sing his praises, to pray, read and study scripture and feast around the table of communion, my prayer for each one of us is that we would draw closer to God's heart stronger in faith, deeper in communion with him, and knew with confidence that deep inner knowing that all will be well. Let us praise God together by singing the wonderful hymn, Crown Him With Many Crowns. Oh, thou 
we continue our series in Jonah, What They Didn't Teach You in Sunday School. This week, we're on chapter three, where we hear of Jonah obeying God's call and going to Nineveh. Let us hear the reading of Jonah chapter three, read for us by Kenneth McKnight, followed by our weekly guest during the series, the Reverend David Campton, performing for us the third in his monologue series, Jonah, the Preposterous Prophet. Let us hear the word of God. Jonah goes to Nineveh. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Four more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. <clears throat> By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals Herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his face anger so we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Hi, made it to Nineveh at last. Not so much wish you were here as wish I wasn't. It's every bit as bad as its reputation. <coughs> it's huge, trekking across it all day. Public transport non-existent. Government cuts. Still haven't got to the city centre. Think I'll set up stall here and let them have it. Should be finished here in 40 days. Nineveh should be finished in 40 days too. <laughs> See you soon. Yours in God's service, Jonah, son of Amittai. P.S. Here's a pick. Our prayers of intercession are based on the song, Father, I place into your hands. So let us pray. Father, we place into your hands the things that we can't do, the things we feel are out of our control. Help us to rely on you and not on our own efforts. We especially think of the COVID-19 situation that we are in at present. We pray for those whose responsibility it is to try and bring it under control, our political leaders, scientists, and others who are working to find a solution to it. We pray for those who are working hard in the NHS and in the community to help those affected by it. We pray for those situations in our own country and further afield and worldwide that concern us too, but that we feel we are powerless to influence. Help us to be faithful in praying for them and to believe that you can change things through prayer. Father, we place into your hands the times that we've been through. We think of the recent lockdown that we've experienced over the last few months 
and how it has impacted our lives. We especially pray for those who are vulnerable, those whose employment has been affected, those whose income has been reduced or stopped. We pray for those who have suffered illness and bereavement. We pray that people may find a solution to the situations that they find themselves in and that they all may feel your grace and courage and strength to help them through these times. Father, we place into your hands our friends and family. You know our concerns, our desires and our aspirations for them. We commit them into your hands. Father, we place into your hands the things that trouble us. Help us to trust you, knowing that you are in control and that you are a mighty God who can do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Father, we pray for ourselves that we may grow in our love for you and devotion to you and may continually rejoice in you. May our purpose in life always be to love to hear your voice and to walk in your ways with you. Help us to do and say the things you would show us as we are guided by you from day to day. May we be the people you would have us be, showing your love to the world and drawing others to you. Father, help us to rest in your presence and as we leave these requests with you in Jesus' name, may we know that we always can trust you. Amen. We continue to worship by singing a hymn by Keith and Kristen Getty, based on Psalm 130, entitled, I Will Wait For You. I can imagine Jonah singing out this hymn from the depths of the sea, whilst in the belly of the fish. When we sing out those words, out of the depths I cry to you, in darkest places I will call. Incline your ear to me and you and hear my cry for mercy, Lord. As the lyrics of this beautiful hymn continue, listen carefully as we hear these words of reassurance. Now he has come to make a way and God himself has paid the price that all who trust in him today find healing in his sacrifice. Let us lift our hearts and voices to God in praise as we sing this beautiful hymn. Put your home. 
Last week, we left Jonah being vomited up by the fish onto dry land. We're not told where exactly this dry land was, but I'm sure Jonah was glad to be on it. Chapter 3 tells of Jonah being called again by God to go to Nineveh. And funny enough, after all he's been through, after his first escape attempt, we read in verse 3. This time, Jonah obeyed the Lord's command. Jonah had learnt his lesson. God was determined that the people in Nineveh should be warned about the road they were heading down and Jonah was to be the person to tell them. So why is Jonah being sent to Nineveh? Well, in chapter 3 it just says, Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you. So we need to look back into chapter 1 to read again what that message was. Chapter 1 verse 2 says, Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it, because I have seen how wicked its people are. Let's remind ourselves what we have learned so far about Nineveh and its people. Nineveh is the capital of the Assyrian Empire, the same Assyrian Empire that wiped out 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel. They were brutal, barbaric, terrible people. But God has spoken to Jonah a second time, telling him to go to their country, and so this time Jonah obeys. God has given Jonah a second chance, a second chance to obey his calling, a second chance to partner with God in the story of salvation of a great and powerful city, a second chance to become the person God made him to be. Isn't it amazing that God doesn't give up on us, even though we may choose to disobey his call on our lives? Perhaps this morning you're thinking, oh, I've messed up big style. God's not going to give me that opportunity again. Take heart this morning. Jonah's story is testimony to the fact that when we repent of our wrong, God will call us again because God is a God of love and reconciliation. And it's not just Jonah's story, but many great people in scripture were given a second chance. Think of David and how he messed up, yet God gave him more opportunities to serve. Think of Simon Peter, who denied even knowing Jesus, yet Jesus calls him again and commissions him to feed his sheep, to preach and teach to the people. And we read throughout the book of Acts all the wonderful things that happened under Peter's ministry. And then we read of John Mark who deserted Paul and Barnabas partway through their first missionary journey. But who we later read of partnering again with Barnabas on a mission trip to Cyprus. God's grace, compassion and desire to be in relationship with us means that he is a God of second chances. Just as great, many great people of scripture have been recipients of it. You too can receive another opportunity from God to love and serve him and to become the person that God had planned for you to be, despite your past. But back to Jonah. God calls Jonah again to go to Nineveh and deliver his message, and this time Jonah agrees. We cannot fully understand what it would have meant for an Israelite to be called to do this task. As the American theologian Tim Mackey explains, the Assyrians had been brutal towards the Israelites on a grand scale. They captured them, skinned them alive and hung them on the city walls. Or they would capture the Israelite soldiers, cut down trees, sharpen the tips of them and impale the soldiers on them and set them up in the hills around the city. The Assyrians were ruthless and barbaric. And this is who God is sending Jonah to, a people who despise the very people that Jonah represents. So we have a a little understanding and dare I say an empathy towards Jonah as to why he ran away the first time. But after the storm and the big fish, after turning to God in prayer and repentance, Jonah, having been given a second chance, goes to Nineveh and tells the people, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. It amazes me that unlike the accounts of what some prophets were told to tell people, the detail, the intensity, the options given, none of that is in this message from God to the Ninevites. In the original Hebrew, the message was just five words long. In English, we have eight words, but why such a short message? It could be for several reasons. Firstly, perhaps the full sermon that Jonah preached just wasn't recorded word for word, but summarised in these few words. Or secondly, perhaps Jonah's heart wasn't in it and he just took the literal words from God and pronounced this warning over the people. Or thirdly, and most likely, Maybe Jonah was happy that they weren't given options. Jonah didn't want them to know God's compassion and love. 
They weren't instructed to turn from their wicked ways. They weren't given the option that when they prayed out to God, he would hear them and save them. No, the simple yet profound message to the people of Nineveh was, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. Whatever the reason, the results of these five Hebrew words is astonishing as we read in verse 5. The people of Nineveh believed God's message. Don't forget, this is the cruel, barbaric people who have slaughtered nations around them. Yet in one warning from God, they believe the message. Can you imagine that happening today? Think of the people you have seen throughout the years standing on street corners, warning people to turn to God before it's too late. So many people just walk on past, ignoring the message. Think of the people who have sat in our church services week after week, yet still don't believe that we need to come to God in repentance and receive his grace and his mercy. This wasn't the story of Nineveh. No, God had prepared the hearts of these rebellious and brutal people. And we read of a whole city, from the greatest to the least, repenting of their actions and turning to God. The message paraphrase puts it this way. The people of Nineveh listened and trusted God. They proclaimed a citywide fast and dressed in burlap to show their repentance. Everyone did it, rich and poor, famous and obscure, leaders and followers. When the message reached the king of Nineveh, he got up off his throne, threw down his royal robe, dressed in burlap and sat in the dirt. Then he issued a public proclamation throughout Nineveh, authorised by him and his leaders. Not one drop of water, not one bite of food for man, woman or animal, including your herds and flocks. Dress them all, both people and animals, in burlap and sit. The people of Nineveh listened and trusted God. They proclaimed a citywide fast and dressed in burlap to show their repentance. Everyone did it, rich and poor, famous and obscure, leaders and followers. Then the message reached the king of Nineveh and he got up off his throne, threw down his royal robes, dressed in burlap and sat down in the dirt. Then he issued a public proclamation throughout Nineveh, authorised by him and his leaders. Not one drop of water, not one bite of food for man, woman or animal, including your herds and flocks. Dress them all, both people and animals, in burlap and send up a cry for help to God. Everyone must turn around, turn back from an evil life and violent ways that stain their hands. Who knows, maybe God will turn around and change his mind about us, quit being angry with us and let us live. And what was God's response? In verse 10 we read, When God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. Why? Why did God respond the way he did? Because God is a God of mercy, grace, compassion, love and forgiveness. The people of Nineveh didn't just pay lip service to God. Their words went empty and shallow. No, their actions, putting on the sackcloth, sitting in the dirt, turning from their evil ways, fasting and prayer, all pointed towards true repentance. What about us this morning? Are we a people of shallow, empty words when it comes to repentance before God? An insincere sorry, hoping that's enough. Perhaps promises that we will break those bad habits, yet our actions don't line up with our words. Or are we like the people of Nineveh, a people of true repentance? Are we truly sorry for the times we've let God down, for the sins of our past, for the habits we know we need to break? Are we honestly sorry for our apathy and judgmentalism, our gossip and our lack of faith? This morning, God is giving each of us another opportunity. You may think to yourself, well, I'm not a bad person. I'm not like the Ninevites. But God calls each one of us to be a holy people, set apart for him and the work he has called us to. Perhaps this morning you know of things in your life that you need to repent from. Things that are holding you back from God, given your God-given calling. Things that are holding you back in your relationship with God. 
Learn from the Ninevites this morning. True repentance leads to the outpouring of God's mercy and grace. As we come to communion, we are reminded of all that Jesus did for us on Calvary, the sacrifice he made for us. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus defeated death and sin. This morning, we are offered new life in Christ. Don't put it off. Whether you have sat in church for years or you're joining with us for the very first time, know this morning that God extends to you his offer of grace and forgiveness. Don't put off the decision any longer to live life as the person God made you to be. 1 John 1 tells us, If we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sin to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. As we prepare our hearts for communion by singing, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Know that God's heart towards you is one of mercy, grace, compassion and forgiveness. No sin is too big for him to forgive and no sin is too small that we don't need to confess it. Don't miss this opportunity this morning. Receive from God his unimaginable, wonderful grace, which is available to all.
hold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Welcome, everyone. I hope you can hear me, and I hope you've not been too distracted by some of the technical difficulties we've been having. Uh, that's because we are broadcasting the service live today. Um, let me just see if you can hear me okay. Yes, good. That seems to be working well. Uh, let me just check if I put words on the screen. Is that going to disappear? No, you can still hear me. Excellent. Um, we're broadcasting live today because um, even though we are physically separated, we are united in Christ. We share in the unity of the Spirit. And it means that if you are joining us uh, at just after 11 o'clock today, um, then we're joined together in, in time as well. Um, when we share the bread and the wine to remember Jesus, we are connected with Jesus. We're connected with those first disciples as they shared this meal. And we're connected with Jesus followers uh, right across the world and throughout time. And we are connected with one another. We want to prepare our hearts for this moment. We want to remind ourselves of our need for God. So let's pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. From you no secrets are hidden. Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts so that we can love God more completely and worship God more fully. God, we confess that our hearts have been in rebellion against you. We have chosen our own way instead of yours. We have sinned against you and against one another in things we have done and in things we have left undone. And maybe just take a moment to call to mind some of those things that you feel you need to confess to God today. God, we are truly sorry. And in this moment, we choose to repent, to turn away from sin and to turn towards Jesus and his ways and to the peace of your constant love. God, forgive us what is past and enable us to serve you as we live the new life that Jesus won for us on the cross. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to continue in prayer and uh, all things being well. Hopefully some words are going to appear on the screen so you can join in the prayers. Uh, and particularly those words that appear in, uh, in capital letters. We'll be saying those together. Um, and I encourage you, wherever you are, if you're at home with others by yourself, just to say, to speak those words out loud if you're able. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. 
Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Lord of all life, you created an amazing universe. All creation reflects your glory. You give us this great and beautiful earth to discover and to cherish. You made all of us, each wonderfully different. So we join with the angels and sing your praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We thank you, loving Father, because when we turned away from you, you sent Jesus, your son. He shows us the way to live and gave his life for us on the cross. But the grave could not hold him. And with a love stronger than death, you raised him to life again. Dying, he destroyed our death. Rising, he restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. On the night before he died, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. And after he had eaten, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks and shared it with his disciples saying, this is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So, Father, with this bread and this cup, we celebrate his love, his death, his risen life, and together declare our faith in Jesus. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so I invite you um, at home to take uh, bread and wine or a cracker and water or whatever it is you have and to set them before you as we prepare ourselves to receive, and we pray. Lord, send your Holy Spirit that these gifts of bread and wine may be for us, Christ's body and his blood. Amen. And as one family gathered around this table. We're going to take uh, the bread and receive it together at the same time as I do and the same then with the cup. The body of Christ given for us. The blood of Christ 
shed for us. we say this prayer together. Lord our God, we give you thanks. By Jesus' death and resurrection, you have saved us from the power of sin and death and invited us to share in the risen life of Jesus. Sustained by this bread and wine, May we live our lives for you in the strength of your love and the power of your spirit. Amen. Amen.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with kindness and give you peace. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.